Okay, so I'm David Howells. Can you can you hear me? Uh, so is that better? So yeah, I, I'm David Howells. I've been working for Red Hat nearly 18 years on a variety of things, from file systems, a couple of architectures, various bits of security stuff, and a whole lot of general stuff. But one of the things I've done is uh, created a, a key management system inside the kernel. For well, It was initially for uh, managing tokens for the FS file system I was writing, but I, to make sure the code isn't too wasted, I tried to spread it around to all sorts of different things. Otherwise, it's just a big hunk of core memory that's not doing anything. So the, the keyring code is, keyring facility is for retaining keys and tokens, as you might be able to guess. So they, they hold, they can hold arbitrary data, but usually it's structured in some way. So for example, uh, you can have file system keys and uh, asymmetric keys. I'll get that to more than that later. Uh, so they, they used to manage the access control, so the man, manage access to this data inside the thing, because they have ownership group and permissions masks. But beyond the usual thing you expect of Unix, like user group and other, they also have a possessor permissions. So each process has a keyring, has keyrings attached. If the key is in that keyring, you're allowed to use it using the possessor permissions instead of user and other and stuff, which means you can have keys that only your process can see. Nobody outside that can see. It also manages the lifetime, so when the last reference goes, the key is automatically deleted, and also keys expire after a while, and when they expire, they're automatically removed from the system, and uh, the, the storage they occupy is uh, reset before it's returned to the system to make sure there's no leakage. And also there are user space interfaces that allow you to mani manipulate these things in various ways. For instance, changing the permissions, changing the ownership, uh, moving them between key rings, granting other people access. And there's also an upcall service. So you say, give me a key for... Uh, one of the things you can is used for using DNS. You give me a D DNS thing for uh, a DNS token for uh, grand.central.org, and it will upcall to the kernel. So, so upcall to use, use space. Use space will actually do the DNS lookup because I don't. I really don't want to put a DNS thing in the kernel. That's just the way. And then that will instantiate the key. And then when you get the key back, you can just read out the contents, assuming you have permission to do so. So the types of payloads you can put in these keys. Uh, you can have authentication tokens of, for network file systems. Uh, crypto, cryptographic tokens, so asymmetric keys, uh, file system encryption, a variety of other things. Uh, you can put passwords in, so there's a key type called logon key. You can put a password in, create a key, stick a password in there, in use space. Use space cannot then get the password back out. You can use the key as a token to pass to like uh, the SIFs, uh, SIFs mounts or whatever. But so the, to the key ID to, to use space then stands for the password and it's just not extractable without cracking the kernel. So you can be used for DNS results. Uh, we also use it for ID mapping in NFS and SIFs. So we use the upcall to say to use space, I have this name or this ID, please go and map it for that file si for this file system. And there's also use the defined key, uh, key type which you can store arbitrary data in and uh, Kerberos makes use of this. Unfortunately, I can't see how I can get my shell. I was going to show you some of this stuff, but I can't make it come up. Uh, 
Uh, can you read that? Does it need to be bigger? Bigger. So I can do things like I can add a key. So what this would do is add a, u a user type, user defined payload key, which basically just takes a blob. C call the key is called foo, and it, the blob will be bar, and it'd be added to my session keying. That's what the ATS stands for. So it gives me a key serial number back. So, so if I view my session key ring, in there you can see I've got uh, a thing called invocation ID, which is from uh, uh, from system uh, system D user manager, I believe, and the key I added. So that, well, there's a special type called key ring type that is a, just a container for other keys, and it is just a key. So you can put keyrings inside keyrings. You can move keyrings about using the same interface as any other thing. So I can then show you what's in the key. So I can just get it out, and then I can. So doing that, I've taken away all permissions on the key. So now I can't do that. And all permissions includes changing the, the actually that should be three, three, three. Includes changing the, the mask, so I can't actually put the permissions back on again. So one thing you can do, you can set the permissions to that person can read, and nobody can change things. So that person can read it, but I can still theoretically get rid of it. Because unlink doesn't require permissions on the thing you're unlinking, only the key ring it's in. So we should just see that it's then gone. And there are other things we can do. Network. <coughs> Oops. I want it to actually do it. So what this should have done is gone and done an up call. So it asked the kernel, it created a key, asked the kernel to up call to the DNS resolver code, which then resolve, went and looked up an AFSDB record for grand.central.org. The up call then put that back in the key and returned. And now that's, the key got instantiated with that and I can just print that out from the key. <laughs> So those are the IP addresses that belong to Grand Not Central to talk. Right. Where was I? Oh. <coughs> so I said that there are thing concepts called keyrings, which are just collections of keys. Every process has access to or ha ha pins three keyrings. The keyrings are optional, so they may, if they don't exist, they're not pinned. But you've got a per thread keyring, which only belongs that only belongs to a particular thread. So if you've got a process with multiple threads, each one has its own keyring, and the other key, uh, the other processes don't necessarily see into that. The other threads in the process don't necessarily necessarily see into that keyring. There's the per process keyring, which all the threads in a process can see. There's the per session keyring, which 
is inherited. Well, when you create it for process, all processes of that forks also inherit that session keying. And, uh, and then there's the per user keying, which processes don't inherit, but PAM stick. When you create a new session, so when you log in and create a new login session, PAM, PAM creates you a session keying and sticks a, a link in there to your per user keying. Or used to, used to. But I have a feeling someone has changed PAM so we didn't do this anymore. Because I should see it, I should see it there and it's not there. I'm not sure why that is. But but I can add my user queuing to my to my session queuing like that. There is also a persistent per user keying which lasts for a certain amount of time once you've logged out. Uh, as I said, keyings have expiry times on them. And when the expiry time, well, keys and keyings have expiry times on them. When they, the ex when they expire, the kernel garbage collector just goes and removes them. This is used by Kerberos to store keys and they persist for say up to three days beyond your last logout which means if you leave a daemon running once you've logged out, it still has access to your Kerberos keys until the Kerberos keys have expired. So that is uh, my persistent queuing. And then I can go and list what's in there. Oh. One mistake I did make was that uh, if you look in the proc keys file, all the numbers are in hex rather than decimal, which means, but the interface requires the hex numbers to be uh, prefixed with zero x. <coughs> and you can see in there, there's a key in colon underscore KRB. That's from uh, uh, Kerberos. <coughs> which I think it's empty at the moment. So the user space API is uh, three system calls and a uh, proc file. So add key, adds a key and instantiates it all in one go. Request key, creates a key, then up calls to go, well, if it searches, first of all, it searches for a matching key. If it doesn't find that, it creates a key and up calls to user space to instantiate the key. And key cuttle is a range of other uh, functions like unlink, link, uh, change the permissions, change the expiry time, things like that. And proc keys is all the keys on the system that you can see. Let's see if I do this. So you can see Root can see a whole load more keys, including some DNS resolvers, blacklist keys from a loader from the UFI database. And there's an asymmetric key at the bottom, which is uh, the module signing key for this kernel, I think. Anyway, we'll get onto that later. And there are two user space utilities that I provided. One is uh, key control, which I've just been using. And the other one is uh, a PAM library, which should be in the PAM configuration. In. So there. So that says to run the <coughs> the PAM key in it thing and to revoke that creates a session key when you log in. And so that's inherited by all the children of the session. And the revoke argument says, revoke the key, key ring on the way out, which means anyone that accesses it there, thereafter gets e key revoked as an error. So I said there's an up call. The up call runs the SBIN request key program, and there's a 
a master config file and a place where you can put other configuration files that tell a request key what to actually run. So it's just a, a program switch. It will look up the key parameters and find something to run. So it looks like that. So the operation create, for example, a, a type. There's a bunch of debug types which you can just create things with. And you can see at the end the, the programs that you can run. Well, the program that gets run if the parameters match. I, in the current merge window, waiting for the current merge window, is a patch to make this more specific. At the moment, it just goes to the file, first match, runs that program. This isn't actually a good way of doing it. Now it goes through all the lines, finds the best match, either the one with the, the, where the stars, the, the wild cards match the least number of characters, and runs that one. So <coughs> current usages in the kernel include authentication tokens for the FS file system, uh, doing kernel uh, caching, doing and caching kernel DNS lookups, doing NFS user ID to ID mapping and SIFS user to ID mapping, uh, FS crypt, which is started with the, for XT4 to do uh, encrypted files, and EcryptFS, which is something you mount over another file system, and it uh, encrypts and decrypts uh, uh, GPG. Uh, encrypted files in the in the lower file system. Uh, there's an asymmetric key type. So you can see the number of keys. Uh, the second one down, the Fedora kernel signing key, that's the one generated by uh, the, uh, the kernel build process. What it does, it creates a, an ASIC, uh, public key, uh, sorry, an RSA public key during the build process, signs all the modules, and then deletes the private key. And the pu public key is compiled into the kernel. And then all the, module, all the modules are signed with that. And so when, as the modules are loaded, it can check the signatures on the modules. There are a bunch of other keys loaded from the UFI, which is why you see some Microsoft ones and things in there. And these, and there are a bunch of special key rings. So it's like you can see built-in trusted keys, sec secondary key rings. I'm not sure what built-in rich DB keys are. I think that may be for firmware. Resolver, blacklist. Uh, so the blacklist keys, which when, when we do a, a signature check, checks the, uh, we, we look up the, the digest in the blacklist key. If it matches, we say you're not allowed to load that module. And or firmware or KXEC, IMA also uses uh, the keys for a similar sort of th thing, but under the IMA banner rather than directly. So there's, the KeyCuttle interface also offers a, a Diffie-Hellman operation, but you, what you do, you have to put a number of keys in, uh, the, the, the parameters into logon keys, and give them to the Diffie-Hellman algorithm, which can then go and do hardware, to do, uh, do this through hardware. Uh, provide t as TPMX, some TPM access available using the, trust, the trusted key type. I must put encrypted wrong. Uh, the trusted key type uh, uses the TPM to unwrap, to seal and unwrap uh, uh, symmetric keys and then retains them inside the kernel. So things inside the kernel can see the keys and can use the keys, but they're not exposed to user space. You have a handle, which is the key serial number, but the actual key, the crypto material, you can't get at. The uh, co co uh, the encrypted key is a used as a trusted key to unwrap a further symmetric key, if I understand that right. Uh, there's a Kerberos makes use of this. If I do,
So you can see a bunch of keys in sort of that region and then there, which were added by Kerberos. So Ker Kerberos is here is using the, the key ring as a uh, uh, credential cache rather than using something in slash temp. And OpenAFS uses it to do PAG emulation because we, we don't like the mucking around of the group, the group ID list inside the kernel. So they now they stick a key in your key ring. Uh, use, use, use a space, uh, use a define key with with a PAG number in it that the kernel can look up. Because the main thing about this is the kernel can access these keys. So user space can use this to provide the key, stuff to the kernel to use. So. Upcoming changes in this merge window. Uh, there are a number of uh, public key operations being added. So encrypt, so encrypt, decrypt, sign and verify. Uh, these will appear as key cuttle commands and they will be available through the key cuttle program. <coughs> So we've added two new parsers to the asymmetric key type. One is you can give it a PKCS, uh, PKCS8 blob. It will parse it and stick the key data contained therein attached to the asymmetric key, which you can then pass to these operations. You can't get the key data back out again. Once it's in there, it's in there. And the other one is a TPM wrapped asymmetric key. So you, you create an asymmetric key somewhere, you wrap it, uh, so you get the TPM to seal it, to, to wrap it in some encryption. You can then pass it to the asymmetric key using add key. It will be, un it will be passed to the TPM to unwrap. And, but then the unwrap stuff is retained inside the kernel. You can't get it back out, but you can use it through the new key cuddle interface. So, on to the future, the future developments I want to do. One is I want to make access, improve access controls. I want to make the permissions finer, finer grained. I want to remove join. One thing you can do is you can join a key ring and make it your session key ring. This is generally a bad idea. Now, now, it's one of the things I shouldn't have added in the first place, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. But I want to make it so this is a separate control so that you have to grant so on the ability to join a key ring. So that someone can't just go and randomly join a key ring, because if they join a key ring, they get access to all the keys in that key ring. So I want to be able to, you can say, no, you're not joining that key ring. And the other one is, uh, I want to make it possible to do invalidate, or invalidation of a key without requiring right access to the, right access to the key. Because at the moment, I think if, we, if I remember rightly, you can do it right access, so you can do it set attribute access, set attribute access. And I want to make it so you, it's a separate one. So I don't have to give you the ability to modify the key. I don't have to give you the, the ability to change the permissions mask on the key. I just say, you can invalidate the key. What invalidate does is, says the garbage collector, get rid of that immediately. And then it's gone. And next time someone does a request for it, it will then up call again, if that's the way they do it. I want to add more flexibility to the subjects. So at the moment you can do it, you've got a user, a user ID and a group ID, and whether you possess it or not. I want to be able to say, that container can access it, or that program can access it. Possibly I could do this with an explicit ACL, I have patches to do this, but it might be better to actually have a key kettle where you say, Basically, like a database grant, grant, grant this access to that entity, and then have the ACL built inside the kernel, possibly so that you can't get the ACL back out again. It just says, yes, you have this access, or no, you don't have this access. <coughs> Notifications. Right, I want to make it so you can find out, you can monitor a key ring, and find, or a key or key ring, and find out if it changes. I have this mostly working, and the way I've done it is it's a general interface and it can be used for watching super blocks, mounts, polity changes, key rings, anything. 
But as I said, I've got it watching key, able to watch key rings at the moment. I'd like to demo that, but I've got to compile the patches into my test into the kernel on this thing. But uh, another thing I want to be able to do is effectively use a key ring as an event collector. So you say, watch that key ring. Any key that gets added to that key ring, initially to that key ring, gets a watch put on it that comes back to this key ring. So you don't have to monitor every single key you add to that key ring because it could be quite a lot. And if a key ring is delete, if a key is deleted or removed from that key ring, the watch goes away on that particular key. Because all these watches take up memory to actually record. What we want to do is make it uh, provide refresh notification. So you get a notification: this key is going to expire in 10 seconds or 10 minutes or whatever. So if it's your Kerberos keyring, it says, by the way, your Kerberos keyring is about to expire. Your file system token is about to expire. Go and do something about it. And another thing I want to add is just a key change counter that you can read. So you, one of the problems with the event, event notification mechanism is you've got a fixed size buffer. And when the buffer's full, all it can say to you is something happened. Possibly something happened in this particular class. So put a counter on the key that says how long, uh, says how, uh, how many times it's changed. So you can just go pull a lot. Namespacing, uh, got problems with namespaces in that uh, keys may exist in different, be used across different namespaces. There's the up calls currently done in the root namespace and it shouldn't be, it should be done in appropriate namespace for a container. And there are special key rings that are currently global but should be per, per namespace. For instance, three of those, those three there should be uh, per network namespace. Containers, I want to be able to put a key ring inside a container that you can use, the container manager can use to provide authenticated access to the root file system and the component file systems inside that container without this thing inside the container having to do the maintenance of these. And also, I, want to be, I need to be able to ac grant access to that container for that key. So, so, I can, uh, so you could put authenticated AFS or authenticated NFS root file system inside your container, but the, person, the program inside the container doesn't need to do anything about Keeping the permission, keeping the token live, because it can be done from outside. Uh, NFS wanted to make it use request keys to look up credentials. We've got some agreements on doing this. This is for the container thing as well, and there you can find some further inform information. There's files in the, the kernel documentation, new man of key rings, and uh, there's a Git tree for the key utils, and that's it. So we can take a couple of quick questions. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for this presentation. It's very good. Um, I have one question. When we are using the Trust Platform module to store the keys, it's stored in the hardware, yes? So the, when we are using the TPM to store the keys, yes, it is stored in the hardware. Uh, uh, so if you talk about the trusted keys, yes, uh, and also the new upcoming stuff that's coming in this version, uh, you give it a, a key blob, which the TPM then unwraps using a key stored in the, the TPM. So okay. the, key, the key you're actually extracting isn't stored in the TPM. It's, you, you give it a blob that's a wrapped key. The TPM unwraps it and then attaches that to a key which you can then use. Okay, thank you. So, but the, the, the unwrapped key data, the crypto data is stored inside the kernel and you're not allowed access, not, not allowed direct access. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kai Engert, hello. Um, are there any intentions for key persistence across reboots? Explicitly, no. Okay, thanks. Except through the TPM sort of thing. More questions? Th 
Thank you for the talk. Um, I had a question about uh, UFI keys. When when you use Secure Boot, uh, public keys from the uh, Secure Boot variables are automatically added to the keyring? In Fedora and RHEL, yes. So it's something which needs to be done manually, but by the distribution? Or? Uh, we have patches, but uh, trying to get them upstream uh, invokes a lot of argument, shall we say, and okay. recrimination and stuff. Security, people hate it. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, James isn't here, otherwise you could ask him why. J James Bottomley. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And M oh, Mimi hates it as well. <laughs> right. Um, so um, we're going to be discussing um, the UEFI keys in Nana and Tiago will be discussing it later in their talk um, as to what we're pro proposing instead of um, adding them to the secondary key ring. At the moment, uh, they're not on the built-in key ring. The built-in key ring is just for those keys that are built in. And um, it's more than Red Hat and um, that's using these keys. Other distros, such as SUSE, I believe, is using these out of stream patches as well. Um, uh, w one other thing I wanted to add was uh, when I talked about adding, uh, Im improving access controls, one of the things I wanted to add in that is also what are the key, make it, you, I would say you can use this key for that as well as you, you, this person can use this key. So you can say this key can only be used for module checking. This key can only be used for firmware checking. Right, okay. Okay, so more questions? There's one of them. Remember, I'll minimize running, so I'll take this one. Hi, uh, any thoughts on uh, integrating this with the crypto API? For example, have a crypto API set key variant that you give not a key, but a uh, a reference to something in a queuing? Uh, it has been mentioned before. Uh, one of the things, the, the, at the moment, uh, apart from the trust encrypted keys, uh, there is no session key support really in uh, management in the key queuing stuff. And the crypto API is almost all about session keys rather than uh, asymmetric, uh, symmetric keys rather than asymmetric keys. So at the moment, they're more or less orthogonal, uh, though I would like to add a general uh, symmetric key handle, basically, that you could then pass through the crypto routines, if algo or whatever. It's just time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. So there was a question over here. Yeah. And I think that's going to be our last question because I have to move to the next speaker. Uh, my question goes into the same direction. Um, not only passing um, a reference to the keyring, uh, from the keyring to the crypto uh, API, but also um, keeping the key in some hardware device on some socks and then passing a reference to the crypto engine so that the crypto engine or the crypto API can make use of the hardware engine so that the key never has to leave the hardware. Yeah. So we, t we talk about the in-kernel crypto stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's one of the things I would like to do at some point. It's somewhere on my list. All right. So there was, do you want to make a remark or? I just said what he asked for already supported in the group. Okay. Yeah. Even better. Okay, but let's move. Let's thank first David for a very good talk.